not because there's no energy available. It's simply that we've called for more energy to be delivered to a given place than the line can take, and the whole system blows. The principle of the household fuse or circuit breaker, keeping supply and demand in near balance, can be extended to all forms of energy. All, in effect, have circuit breakers. And when the demand grows greater than the immediate supply, the circuits break. Attention all passengers, flight 307 is canceled until further notice. It was announced today that gasless Sundays will go into effect as of next month. And when several circuits break at the same time, we have an energy crisis. We're in an energy crisis now and will be for some time to come. All we can do is face it, recognize it, and meet the challenges it poses. Ours is a crisis characterized by shortages of all kinds. We have at present an absolute shortage of natural gas. We cannot produce as much as we can use, as we are equipped to use in our homes and our factories. This situation is destined to continue indefinitely. And by indefinitely, I mean not only just the next few years, but as far ahead as we can see. Crisis is nothing new to man, whose progress from earliest times has been marked by a constant quest for new ways to harness and make use of energy resources. He learned to use winds to grind grain. Burning wood provided him with heat. With the coming of steam engines, wood would become the source of fuel to push ships and trains across the face of the earth. Coal was the first fossil fuel to be exploited as a seemingly endless source of heat and power. We tunneled deep into the earth to dig it out. History is filled with references to oil, the fossil fuel we most rely on today. As far back as 300 BC, the Chinese drilled 3,000 feet for oil using bamboo tubes and bronze bits. In 1859, Edward Drake drilled this country's first producing oil well near Titusville, Pennsylvania. The coming of oil triggered a rush to likely looking spots as prospectors set out to claim quick and easy riches. Spindletop in East Texas. The Seminole Fields of Oklahoma. Edison's invention of the light bulb would lead to a world electrified and increase the need for coal and oil and natural gas to generate electric power. The gasoline engine demanded fuel to run our cars. Energy was something to use and use and use. As the pace of life quickened, we were into the 20th century. Now there were cars, trains, airplanes, Appliances galore. Our industrial progress and economic growth was fired by what many seemed to look on as endless energy. But warning signs were there. Until 1950, the United States could supply the energy needed. But in less than 25 years, we found ourselves in trouble. Each year, we used 5% more doubling our demand every 12 to 14 years. Coal production stayed at 1940s levels. Crude oil production dropped. In 1968, natural gas consumption began exceeding new discoveries. Oil companies during this period were encouraged to get oil and gas from other countries. By 1970, we imported one third of our oil and gas, relying on others to meet new needs. Then, in 1973, the big Middle East producers cut off oil shipments to major consuming countries. When the embargo was lifted, the price of foreign oil had jumped from three to $12 a barrel, four times higher than before. More than $20 billion left the United States. No one was spared its impact. 
Well, just looking at my bills, I'm getting upset. Paying more for electricity every month. And the gasoline is going up. And I'm used to being able to go when I want to, when I want to. But suddenly, I think I'm going to have to start curbing my habits. My family and I have uh, tended to conserve energy, uh, both in limiting the use of our cars, plus cut back on the, um, the heat in the home, less use of the air conditioner, and, um, and in general, a conservation ethics has uh, uh, come across our house. What I've seen of people, most of them are pretty selfish. It's all right to let somebody else do it, but when it comes right down at home, why they, they just want to go along the same old way. Although some went on in the same old way, eventually the Middle East embargo would be felt by all of us. One out of every seven gallons of oil we'd been using to power our homes, our cars, our businesses, and our schools just wasn't there anymore. At the height of the embargo, half a million people were thrown out of work. Products we manufactured and sold dropped from 10 to 20 billion dollars in value. We were caught by surprise with a crisis that could recur and recur unless the entire country recognized the dangers of a quite real energy shortage. And out of the embargo was born Project Independence, a launching pad from which would evolve this country's first national energy policy. We must be able to cope with future emergencies. We must immediately fully use our traditional energy sources. We must develop new sources. We must manage better the present demands placed on energy. We must conserve. The first three goals are largely the job of government and industry. The fourth, conservation, is up to all of us. The blueprint was designed to make the United States energy self-sufficient by 1985. That is, we would import some oil, but would not be so dependent on other countries. To meet this challenge, we must change our energy habits. We must end our love affair with the big car and use buses and commuter trains. We must walk or use bikes rather than drive. We must pay more attention to energy used in the home to guarantee that cool air is kept in in the summer, warm air in the winter months. When lights aren't needed, they should be turned out. But cutbacks by individuals are not enough to prevent future shortages. Converting raw materials into energy uses up a tremendous amount of energy itself. So do manufacturing and heavy industrial plants. We must save fuel there, too. Here at the uh, San Leandro plant, we have uh, reduced our energy consumption 25%. We've achieved this primarily by being smart about when we turn lights off and on. and. Uh, making sure that our equipment is running in the most efficient manner and turning our thermostats down. And when you look at it, it, uh, it, you wonder why you didn't do this before, but I'm, I'm sure it'll be carried forward in the future and, and new and better ways to conserve energy will be uh, thought of. Waste material can be used as a source of energy. A project in St. Louis has proven that garbage can be put to use in generating power. Used fuel that once we paid others to haul away is being recycled. Manufacturers of basic products can now collect, crush, compact and recycle metal containers once considered fit only for the garbage heap. This can result in as much as a 95% savings in energy over what it would cost to start with raw materials. Our savings here to date are well in excess of a million dollars in plain hard cash. So we're convinced that uh, an energy conservation in addition to saving energy and uh, conserving short fuel supplies is just plain good business sense. For all these first steps taken in conserving energy, Real conservation means planning by all of us for most efficient use of energy in the future. 
Real conservation means planning our office buildings, industrial complexes, and homes to take advantage of natural light, natural heat, natural coolness, natural ventilation. Real conservation means that while striving to achieve the most efficient car and truck engine, we must limit our driving now to what is absolutely necessary. The fact remains that conservation alone will not give us the energy needed to permit our country to prosper at its present level. This brings us to the second goal, to develop our oil, coal, and gas. Much of this country, particularly in the West, was once a sea. Today, it's a sea of scrub oak, sand, and sage. And beneath its surface lie rich pools of oil and beds of coal, enough, some say, to answer our needs for centuries. So great is our demand that we're looking for new energy in places once considered sacrosanct. Drilling for natural gas is taking place in George Washington National Forest in Virginia. It's a trend that more and more local utilities are getting into because they, they have to protect their pipeline supply in some way. They're going into drilling programs such as this one. They're building synthetic gas plants, importing liquefied natural gas. Uh, because for at least the foreseeable future, we don't anticipate any, any major increase in the, in the pipeline quantity of gas available to us. But as many wells as may be drilled, the prospect of big strikes on this continent appear remote. While the average well in the Middle East produces 5,000 barrels of oil a day, the best producing wells in the United States provide far less. And proven reserves in the lower 48 states grow smaller every year. Though exploration has been stepped up, production continues to lag. The search goes on elsewhere. We're tapping huge reserves within the Arctic Circle on the north slope of Alaska. Some geologists claim that the world's greatest fossil fuel resources lie beneath ocean waters, in the North Sea, off Indonesia, in the Gulf of Mexico, off the eastern seaboard. But underwater drilling is expensive and risky. Floating platforms are towed out to sea and anchored. Drilling rigs are assembled on them at great cost and bits are sent nine to 10,000 feet and more deep into the ocean floor. Oil and gas from 18 to 30 wells may pass through one processing rig in a given day for storage, piping, or sending on to land by tanker. Proven pools are being tapped beneath these waters in the Gulf of Mexico. Natural gas from land as well as ocean-based wells is compressed and piped by booster stations across the country from storage facilities mostly based in Louisiana and Texas. But more gas fields must be found and developed if we're to meet our growing needs. On the Rocky Mountains' western slopes, oil shale, oil-filled rock, is being mined and processed in an experimental plant. Though it's now expensive to get crude oil out of the rock, it could someday answer a good portion of our oil needs. In terms of the reserves available in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming, they are very large. The uh, high-quality mineable reserves that might be produced in the foreseeable future are also very large. This could be in the range of 5 to 10 percent of our total liquid fuel requirement. What about coal? Coal remains one of our greatest resources. There are only two ways to get at it. For generations, we've gone underground to mine it. Much has already been brought to the surface. Far more remains below. Another way to get coal is to strip off a layer of soil and rock. Rich veins of coal, particularly in the west, are there just under the surface. 
how you get coal, where you use it, how you dispose of the waste, all pose problems. Too often our countryside has been left scarred with mine waste. Those concerned about strip mining warn of land ravaged by bulldozers, stripped of all greenery, once rich plains left desolate. Eastern coal is more likely to pollute the air than western coal. But western coal is far from cities and industrial areas where it's needed. Laws now require anti-pollution devices to screen out more than 99% of the ash and waste that once blackened the air around coal-fired generators. Those who have not complied with such standards in the past must do so in the future so that dirty coal can be used in a clean way. Then vapors will be no more than steam, which evaporates a few yards away. And strip-mined land can be reclaimed and restored by replacing topsoil and planting trees and grasses. While we'll never make a forest out of this area, we'll certainly return the land to better shape than we found it before the coal was taken out. It's a grazing area. Several times a year, the flocks of sheep go through here. The antelope congregate in this valley during the winter. They return, and we're very proud of this. They're kind of our pets around here. It's expected that within a few years, we'll be calling on electricity to supply half of our energy needs. Unless we find new ways to turn our generators, we face serious electricity shortages. And we're approaching the outer limits of production in some areas, as with hydroelectric power. You uh, are limited as to geography because you have to have a source of falling water. And most of these uh, best sites have already been used. You have to bear in mind, too, that there are problems uh, in balancing uh, whether the hydroelectric capacity should be installed. Because when you build a dam, of course, you have to flood uh, some area, building up the reservoir uh, and back at it. All these things have to be taken into account in a balanced view of the, uh, of the energy and the environmental values to be considered. Compromises have been worked out which protect our environment at the same time satisfying fuel needs. More than 600 wells on four man-made islands in Long Beach Harbor, California, draw oil from pools as far as four miles away. Enclosed drilling superstructures actually enhance a city skyline once marked by blackened derricks. That's one way to attack the shortage while protecting the environment. But as with conservation, developing traditional energy resources is not enough. We need new sources. That brings us to our third goal, finding new kinds of energy. There's nuclear power. One theory is that nuclear fusion may be generated by injecting atomic neutral particles into a magnetic field. Still another involves use of laser beams. Our hope is to demonstrate or perhaps uh, come up with the invention of the new lasers required to make laser fusion reactors in the early 80s and perhaps have a prototype reactor going in the 1990s. Though power generated by nuclear fusion lies in the distant future, power from nuclear fission the splitting of atoms already is a fact. But construction delays and the high cost of financing threaten to undermine the United States' goal of having half of all electricity supplied by nuclear power by the year 2000. Another proven source for energy is geothermal power, heat beneath the surface of the Earth. Commercially feasible plants for generating electricity are already operating at the geysers near San Francisco. We hope that by the year 2000, we are hopeful that we are going to be able to get on the line maybe as much as 75,000 megawatts. Or, again, with the current rate of consumption, that would supply the needs of 75 million people. This area is an ideal source to tap for power. But only four such fields have yet been found. This one in California, one in Italy, one in Iceland, and one in New Zealand. 
we're still learning how to explore for geothermal power and how to use it once we find it. Again, the target date for meaningful production beyond what we now have, the next decade. Success has been limited so far in attempts to capture and use the sun's energy directly. But there are an increasing number of solar heated buildings and homes. We've been living in solar heated houses for the past 15 years. Our first winter fuel bill here in Washington, D.C. was only $4.65. We used only 31 gallons of oil for an entire winter. And that was with half our days cloudy and temperatures down well below freezing many times. The principle of solar heat is quite simple. It works best in areas where most of the days are sunny. Water running through panels is warmed by the sun's rays, heating the house, providing hot water for families, being stored during the night for use around the clock. Solar heat is practical. It works. But it must be supplemented by traditional energy sources. No real breakthrough has been made in converting solar energy into electric power. Target date for this new development? No year mentioned. Scientists and engineers are engaged in basic research now to find other sources of energy. Wind power, underground coal gasification, breeder reactors, tidal power. But no one presumes to lay down a timetable for achieving man's age-old dream of unlimited energy. The goal seems too remote. For the next 10 years, we must rely on the fossil fuels which have served us in the past. With oil and gas production in this country going down each year, we have no alternative but to conserve. Otherwise, we are faced with a dollar drain that within one short decade could result in concentrating the world's wealth in the Middle East. The oil exporter gets richer and the oil importer gets poorer and the consumer pays the bill. Unless we conserve while we look for new energy sources, we face the recurring threat of embargoes, of energy circuits breaking without warning. We must recognize right now that energy will cost us more. That is a fact of life. I think it's going to end with everybody changing their, their habits and uh, going back to the things that maybe our parents were used to that we have never seen before. Just start working now, otherwise we won't have time. We're going to be out of oil within a few years. People say, well, it's not going to run out in our time. We have to think of our kids and our kids' kids and how they're going to have to put up with a whole lot of stuff uh, just because we're not careful. We must change if we're going to have the energy we need. If we want new oil, we've got to look in new places. We must demand more efficient engines for our cars. We must push forward, at whatever cost, the development of new energy resources. We must make personal commitments to cut down wherever we can on the energy we use. Only this can keep the total energy circuit from breaking, disastrously, for all of us. The energy is here, within this universe, on this planet. It's a challenge facing each of us in all lands to explore, to find, to develop, and to use wisely, not wastefully, the energy that's here. If we meet this challenge, it will be for the good of all mankind on Earth.